When every driver goes into Formula 1, they all dream of one thing, becoming Formula 1 World Champion. Well, apart from Yuki Tsunoda. Formula 1 World Champion. Formula 1 World Champion. To be a World Champion. World Champion. World Champion. I opened the restaurant. <laughs> my, my restaurant. <laughs> yeah, it's true. In this new series, I'm going to be looking at drivers who came close but never won it in their careers, but with a twist. I'm going to be looking at the 10 best drivers of the 1950s to have not won the Formula 1 World Championship in their entire career. So this does not include drivers who did compete in the 50s but did not win a World Championship until later on such as Phil Hill or Graham Hill for example. So let's get started with number 10 who is Eugenio Castellotti. Born in northern Italy in 1930, Castellotti began racing professionally, from the records I've been able to collect anyway, I'm not talking about music of course, in 1952, winning several European sports car races until Lancia saw this and they decided to sign him for 1953. He then took part in the 10 hours of Messina and won that race. I think it's Messina, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And then, after winning that, he decided to make his own entry into the Mili Miglia and he retired in that with clutch issues. Now I just want to very quickly have a very quick off note about the Mili Miglia because it was a ridiculously dangerous race. So this man had a pair of cojones on him for to actually enter that race in the first place. Because it was like, imagine imagine the 24 hour of Le Mans in the 1960s and 50s. You know, the 1955 Le Mans disaster, 83 people died, right? But on public roads. That is the Mili Miglia. So Castellotti was now awaiting Lancia's Grand Prix car. Yeah, I bet you guys didn't know that. Lancia actually had a Formula 1 team. Um, which was to be designed by the legendary Vittorio Giano, who was a very, very good designer. He, he wasn't on the level of, you know, Colin Chapman or Adrian Newey, but he was on the level probably of somebody like... Um, he was better than guys like Gustav Brunner, but he probably... He, he was better than them. He was probably a little bit lower down than Gordon Murray. Um, he was probably about Steve Nichols, probably, in terms of like how good he was. So, Castellotti competed in the 1954 Tourist Trophy, uh, driving the Lancia D24, which was a sports car, alongside Robert Manzon, who would be his teammate for quite a few years, and was a very talented driver himself, and one of the oldest living, as you're going to find out later on. And one of his teammates was none other than the legendary Formula 1 driver, and who some people argue is the greatest of all time, Juan Manuel Fangio. As um, he, and then he'd go on to finish third in that race and co-piloted with Fangio, yes, Juan Manuel Fangio at Sebring, however, retired 51 laps into the race with a rear axle problem. Sebring was one of the biggest races at the time and you know, for him to be with Fangio was a massive honor, I assume for him. After waiting for two years, Castellotti finally had a Grand Prix car to drive which was the Lancia D50, and that would be used by both um, them and Ferrari. His debut was decent, qualifying 12th before switching with Luigi Villaresi. And if you're wondering why they switched cars, one man will find you in the very same race got a severe burn. In fact, according to former Ferrari and Maserati chief mechanic Giulio Borsari, Fangio actually moved to Argentina a month before the race and reduced his water consumption to only a litre a day to deal with the extreme heat. He took method acting to the extreme and as a result he suffered severe burns to his leg and um, it took him three months to recover from it. But thankfully for him, the race was not until late May. The lucky guy. Although what wasn't so lucky was that he did have a permanent scar on his leg when he was a little bit older. Villaresi crashed on lap 35, but to be fair, the conditions, I'm not, with the conditions, I'm not surprised he crashed, because the drivers must have been so exhausted that they lost concentration, and that just shows how, you know, pe pe people say today that F1 athletes, you know, they're, they're very, very, um, you know, fit. Even back then, you had to be a tiny bit fit, and you had to be able to survive conditions like that in cars where the engine was in the front. I mean, I can't imagine that, because it must have been so much trickier to drive those cars at the time. Um, Monaco was next, and he did a brilliant job in qualifying. He outqualified Villaresi by 1.7 seconds, 
and he was eight tenths behind um, world champion Alberto Ascari. Ascari wasn't the reigning champion, but he was still regarded as one of Formula One's best drivers, along with the likes of Gonzalez, um, Fangio, who was regarded as the best because he was, he was the reigning world champion, and um, other drivers such as Mike Hawthorne. Um, so for him to only be that much short of Ascari, considering it was only his second Formula One race, was pretty impressive. Um, although Monaco is quite a short circuit, so that's the only criticism you could really give. Maybe he could be a little bit closer. Castellotti ran really high up in the early stages, and he dueled with Ascari, his teammate, a two-time world champion teammate, and John Berra for third until lap 36. He then hit issues, made his way back up the field, and was aided by retirements to Sterling Moss. Blowing up. Smoke is pouring out of the car. He pulls straight into the pits. Mechanics jump over the pit counter and tear off the bonnet as Moss climbs out. St. Vangio's Mercedes. And then Ascari famously, iconically, binning it in the Monaco Harbour. Ascari has overshot the chicane. The car has somersaulted straight into the harbour. Frogman standing by dive in to rescue Ascari, but his blue helmet pops up over... Castellotti came home second, behind Morris Trintignan some 20 seconds back, but he probably felt he could have won that race because he had the pace and he was quicker than Trintignan over the weekend. He just had that bad luck where he had those problems in the middle of the race. His momentum continued as he qualified on pole in only his third Formula 1 race for the Belgian Grand Prix. His pace over one lap did not come into the race though, as he started, he was running third behind the, the silver arrows of Moss and Fangio. Still, but Moss has taken second position from Castellotti in front of Kling, Berra and Farina. Then Hawthorne, Trentignon, Mirez, Pediza, Rosier and... Until a gearbox um, issue, error, problem, I'm going to be using those words a lot today, on lap 16, which was a common problem at Spa-Francorchamps because of the nature of the circuit. Halfway through the season, he was sick in the standings behind Indy 500 winner Bob Swaker, who was, you know, not a Grand Prix driver, so you'd say he was fifth at the Grand Prix drivers, as well as uh, Giuseppe Farina, Trintignant, and Fangio. Um, oh, and Moss as well. Moss was fifth in the standings. So that's a pretty good pedigree of drivers, you know? You got two world champions, a Grand Prix winner, and um, a consistent, uh, well, you got a couple, I think he was, he had gotten one or two podiums at that point in the season, Moss. Um, but then, um, later on, of course, he, he did a little bit um, better. He, he won an, an entry, but we'll talk about that later. However, it was at this point where Castellotti may have thought for a brief moment that his Formula 1 career might have come to an end at some point, anyway. Um, at this stage, anyway. Maybe later on he'd come back. As Lanskia pulled out of Formula 1 due to a number of reasons. A combination of financial issues and, unfortunately, the death of Ascari. As Ascari had passed away, just a few days after the Monaco Harbour crash, as I, I think it was Castellotti himself was testing a sports car and he was good friends with Ascari. Ascari decided to get in and do a couple laps and despite being very superstitious, he didn't follow his, his superstitions and unfortunately lost his life at the very corner, which is now named after him, Ascari. Um, so as a result of this, most of what was left of Lancia went to Ferrari. It was resourced into Ferrari. And so Castellotti came along with them and became one of Ferrari's drivers. He debuted, he debuted for them in Zandvoort and qualified 9th. He'd finished 5th after retirements to Peter Walker, Carl Kling and Trintignant. So now he was tied 5th with Swiker in the standings and closed in on Trintignant and Farina as Moss was pulling ahead because this was when he started to, hit, to find form for Mercedes. He had finished just 3 tenths behind, uh, a couple tenths behind Fangio in the Dutch Grand Prix. So now he was chasing, he now he realised his targets were Farina and Trintignant to chase down in the standings. Because Farina had suffered from injuries, such as crashes in the Mille Miglia and the Super Corte Maggiore Grand Prix at Monza, which left him to withdraw from the rest of the season. So he'd only done three races. So uh, Aintree came and Ferrari struggled desperately as Castellotti was the highest qualifying Ferrari in 10th. It was a poor race for Ferrari in general, with Castellotti retiring on lap 16 and then finishing in 6th with a shared drive with Hawthorne, so he basically got what- uh, he didn't even get points, because only the top 5 got points at that point in Formula 1 history, and if you had a shared drive, you'd get half the points. So he finished in 5th, he'd get 1 point, and so on and so forth. 
because you'd get two points for that. Due to the sheer power of the Mercedes heading into the, so this was now they're heading into the final round of the season at Monza, which was a very, very much engine and downforce sort of circuit. And um, due to the sheer power of the Mercedes, they dominated qualifying, with Castellotti being best of the rest, some 1.3 seconds behind Kling in third. And annoyingly, Piero Taruffi had entered a Mercedes into that race, so the possibility of a 1-2-3-4 seemed likely. And those fears seemed to have been met, as they were running so for 18 laps before Moss dropped down the order, and then retired on lap 27 with engine problems. Then, Kling retired on lap 32 with gearbox issues, meaning that the running order was now Fangio, Taruffi, and Castellotti. So Castellotti just needed to stay in third to secure what was basically the best of the rest in the standings, behind the two Mercedes of Moss and Fangio. And he stayed there for the rest of the race, and in his rookie Formula 1 season, finished third in the driver standings. Now this was the highest place finish for a rookie in Formula 1 history at the time, if you're just counting the first ever Grand Prix season. And it would remain such until 1996 when he was finally beaten by Jacques Villeneuve. And he and um, Clay Regazzoni held the record together for 26 years, as Regazzoni um, finished third in his rookie Formula 1 season 15 years later in 1970. Funnily enough, both of them were driving for Ferrari in those seasons. Despite having an average qualifying position of 3.571 in 1956, he was only sick from the standings as he was shafted by Ferrari and had a number of mechanical problems and, poor, and had a couple of poor results. As Peter Collins and Juan Manuel Fangio were prioritised after it was realised early on in the season that those two seemed to be the drivers with the best chance of winning the championship. Although he nearly won the French Grand Prix and just about missed out from Collins, and had he won that, it would have been his only Grand Prix win. In the end, um, much was expected in 1957. Fourth place qualifying in Argentina resulted in uh, no points in Argentina as he had mechanical problems, and unfortunately, this was his final Grand Prix because in Modena, um, he was testing a Ferrari um, because they were trying to beat Jean Berra's time, uh, Jean Berra's Maserati's time, and um, he went over a very high curb because Modena was a very dangerous circuit at the time. He went over a high curb and uh, he got thrown out of the car and passed away, aged only 26. He has successes in sports cars, winning the Mille Miglia in 1956, which is again an incredible achievement. Uh, as well as the 12 hours of Sebring in the same year. And in the year he passed away, he won the 1,000 kilometers of Buenos Aires and finished third in the Targa Florio. He is considered one of Formula 1's finest not to have won a Grand Prix and is number 10 on my list. Thank you guys so much for watching. Like and subscribe and go and check out the Formula Nerds article which was written on the very same topic, albeit with a few different changes to it. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. And uh, I'll see you all in the next video, which will hopefully be part two, which will be out eventually. It's the first time I've done a video in a while, so sorry if the editing isn't great. Again, like and subscribe, please.